Welcome back, everybody, to Beat the Big Guys. And I'm really excited about my guest today. Her name is Dr. Samantha Montano, and I've read her entire book. It's excellent. I highly recommend it. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about my guest today. Dr. Samantha Montano is an assistant professor of emergency management at Massachusetts Maritime Academy and the author of the book, Disasterology, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Climate Crisis. Welcome, Samantha. Thanks so much for having me. You are so welcome. Now, I thank you for taking time out of your schedule because you have a book that just came out and I'm sure you have interviews constantly and are probably, you know, probably exhausted from all the work with, of a book coming out, but it's also very exciting. And I'm so glad you, that you did write this very, very important book. But why don't you go ahead and tell our listeners why you felt it was important that you write the book, Disasterology. Yeah, so I first got it started doing disaster work in New Orleans uh, in 2006. And I um, arrived in New Orleans to help with the recovery. And I just had never seen a catastrophe of that scale before. And I ended up moving to the city. I lived there for four years doing recovery work. And I felt like I was just kind of bouncing around from one organization to another. And I was kind of very confused at how the recovery process was unfolding. I was infuriated with the injustices that I saw. I had the opportunity to go to some other disasters around the country and saw similar problems arise in those recoveries as well. And uh, this led me on a path to graduate school where I started to learn about our emergency management system in the U.S. to learn about what the research says, what policy says about how we should be responding to these events, recovering from these events, preventing these events from happening. And as I learned that research, I said, oh, people have been writing about this. They've been studying this for a really long time. And there is a, a lot of information here that could be really useful to the public, to people who work in nonprofits who are doing this kind of grassroots work post-disaster. And that information is not trickling down to those people. And so eventually, a decade later, here I am having written the book, um, which hopefully, you know, I wrote in a way that kind of anybody can pick it up and read it and hopefully learn from it and find ways to apply it into the disaster work that they're doing. Well, I'm so glad you did. Um, having published a book myself and gone through the very difficult process of finding a publisher, which was very difficult for me because by the time I published my book, uh, Why the Levees Broke in New Orleans, um, people had what they called Katrina fatigue. And I had a difficult time finding a publisher. Um, what was your experience finding a publisher for your book? So I got really lucky in that a book agent reached out to me based on some other writing that I had done. And her and I, Tess Calero, we really connected on what the vision for the book was. And she kind of held my hand through the entire process of finding a publisher. But we went to many different publishers, uh, worked on many, many drafts of the proposal, the book that kind of uh, has ended up to be what was published is very different than kind of how things started, I think, for the better. Uh, so it was a very long, I mean, four or five year process of finding a publisher, writing the book and getting to this point. For any of you out there that um, look thinking about writing a book, you have to be patient you have to be patient. You will find a publisher. As my mother, um, my mother-in-law, a highly published author once told me, you only need one publisher. And so that should give you a little confidence. But it is, it is difficult. It is a jungle out there. Well, I'm so glad you stuck with it. What were some of the, um, I'm sure you had some doors slammed in your face and I did too. Um, so what were some of the of the um, reasons used to say, we don't think a book like yours is needed. They were wrong, of course, but what are some of the things you heard? Well, I think the big thing for me was this idea that it was going to be a book that had research in it that was meant for a public audience. That was a, a surprisingly hard sell. Um, and it uh, that came not necessarily even as much from publishers, but just from kind of uh, other people within uh, 
academia who saw what I was doing, kind of not going to an academic press as being very unusual and, and something that necessarily didn't necessarily align with kind of what an academic should be doing in terms of uh, in terms of research and science communication. So there's definitely been uh, a bit of pushback in that sense. But uh, ultimately, I think now that it's out, people see the value of this book, and uh, you know it, it's gotten good feedback on it. Uh, and I, I think that uh, hopefully, as more people read it, it'll kind of continue to prove its value. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, one of your reviews, um, uh, Divi Lockwood, through both her personal experiences and extensive research in emergency management, Dr. Montano guides us from disaster to, to disaster. And I, I also think that makes it interesting. Uh, you're ha drawing from your personal experience. Uh, we can always sit down to a textbook, but I believe strongly that personal experience really does make a book more interesting. I, I, my own book was criticized by some, by some of the more academic people. It's the academics that don't like it. The academics wants you to stick with the, the dry detail, um, data uh, dense, uh, and not all academics, but a lot of them. So will you, you, would, say, how would you feel I, about that? <laughs> I am an academic. I've read your book. I think it's fantastic. So ignore them. <laughs> um, no, look, I mean, the, you know, when we are talking about research, when we're communicating about policy, we have different audiences. And is this the book I would have written for other disaster researchers? No, of course not. They understand the theory that's in that book. They understand the research that's in the book, right? Those, those are the founding studies of our field. It's nothing new to them, um, but they're not my audience, right? My audience is the public. It's the people who are working day-to-day -day in nonprofits, slogging through a recovery. It's the people who run uh, a local emergency management agency and need help seeing kind of the bigger picture of our field. Uh, it's for, you know, the congressional staffers who have a chance to influence policy. You know, that's who the book is for. And uh, so writing some kind of dry academic jargon filled book is not going to reach those people. That's not going to make a difference, which is what the point of this book is. That was really a really smart move on your part. Now, one thing we can both agree on uh, is in a disaster, a lot of money can be made by shrewd uh, and not always ethical businessmen. Okay, we can all agree on that. Uh, and in addition, uh, a lot you, politic politicians can earn themselves a name. Uh, the, the, the biggest, the most obvious example is Rudy Giuliani, you know, who blew all that goodwill later on, but Rudy Giuliani made a name for himself from a disaster. Um, our governor, Bobby Jindal, made a name for himself after Hurricane Gustav, which was much better, had a much better disaster recovery than the, the Hurricane Katrina disaster or the levee breach disaster just three years earlier. And then more recently, Andrew Cuomo, uh, after uh, the, the, the COVID outbreak. And again, all three of them have probably squandered a lot of that, all or, or most of that goodwill. But nonetheless, businesses can make money, politicians can make a name for themselves and with a name comes money. Um, so with all of this going on, why is it so hard to get our Congress members to pass disaster management legislation? What's the holdup? What do you think? Well, you know, I think this is what makes emergency management reform so difficult is that there kind of are a lot of big guys that you're up against. It's not just one person. It's not just one industry. We are up against the oil and gas industry, developers, the politicians who are financed by those industries, people who are invested in maintaining the status quo, people who, like you said, are profiting off disasters, insurance industry, construction companies, right? There's this very, very long list of people who uh, either have, uh, have something invested uh, 
in trying to keep the status quo or who actively are making money and profiting off of disaster. And so when we're, you know, talking about emergency management reform, it's really having to go up against all of these major industries uh, at the same time that emergency management doesn't really have a lobby in Congress. There are disaster survivors. There are certain nonprofits across the country who have uh, been able to kind of go to Washington and, and make a little bit of a dent after certain disasters. But uh, past emergency managers themselves across the country, there really isn't anybody who is lobbying for these changes. And certainly nobody who is uh, you know, able to exert any kind of real power in this situation. So it sounds to me, if I'm understanding you properly, that the burden for any meaningful change actually falls on the disaster survivors. Right, which is, uh, you know, putting aside, putting aside the like ethics of that, just logistically, that becomes incredibly difficult because those are the very people who are themselves going through recovery, trying to rebuild their own lives, trying to rebuild their community. They don't have time to be, you know, negotiating national emergency management policy reform, right? That's not, uh, you know, what people have time for. That's and, and oftentimes it's not where their expertise lies, right? They may have their own experience with their particular disaster. But when we're talking about this bigger reform, you need people who have a real depth of expertise, who has been through many disasters, who understands the policy landscapes, understands the research, understands what the solutions are, where there are kind of false solutions that are, are being suggested. It, it's a really complicated uh, process and uh, to be able to find kind of a, a coalition of people who are able to advocate for that it is really challenging. Well, what, fortunately, uh, and for those of you listeners who have listened to past episodes of this podcast, the most powerful people, the people that have the most power in Congress are those people who are not getting paid to and are, are representing their communities, unpaid representatives of communities. They have more power than, than the lobbyists do. So that's encouraging. So perhaps there's a way, you know, listening to what you just said, like, let, and we can pick, pick a disaster, any disaster. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are too many, but let's pick a, a recent one, Hur Hurricane Ida. Um, uh, the folks of Laplace, it, it's terribly sad. Uh, that, that's an area of, of Louisiana near Lake Pontchartrain that got pretty much deluged by a lake, uh, lake, lake water. So, so if, the, if these people, could um, co coalesce and and get represented either here in the state or in in the in the um, in Washington D.C. They have the utmost power, uh, but as you pointed out, they don't have the expertise. Uh, they don't have the knowledge. But what pe people like you could do um, and other experts is help them with expertise and advice and guidance. Did that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Laplace, but also Southeast Louisiana, Southwest Louisiana also right now, um, you know, folks there are really are in a position if there are organizations that are in a position to be having kind of these bigger conversations, which I think when you live in Louisiana and you have one disaster after another, it kind of raises uh, an importance of making these longer term changes to how we approach uh, our disaster risk across the country that, uh, you know, finding that solidarity uh, across different communities that are experiencing similar uh, events and similar issues is the way we move forward. Um, I talk about in my, in my book that there is a need for a disaster movement across the country and that because of how many disasters we have had recently, there are disaster survivors in California, in the Midwest, in the on the Gulf Coast, in the East Coast that all have similar experiences. And if all of those survivors would talk to one another, um, I think they would really see how remarkably similar their experiences experiences are in terms of not being able to get the resources they need, uh, challenges working with FEMA, challenges of 
uh, communicating and kind of learning about what the recovery process is even going to look like from them. Um, and it, it's really a matter of kind of trying to pull all of those different groups together um, so that there can be um, kind of that, that shared storytelling and, and a, a move to a much broader collective action. Well, that is such a cool idea. And, and we're going to talk more about that right now. But first, thank you, Samantha, for reminding me that just Laplace wasn't uh didn't have a terrible disaster thank you for reminding me i the rest of louisiana i did not mean to be um so inconsiderate um the mid mid louisiana south louisiana uh the homer area the thibodeau era terrebonne area badly badly affected by this um my mistake was when i mentioned laplace that they were hit the worst uh, they had, you know, eight feet of water in their homes, literally lost everything, no electricity. I mean, they were hit the worst, but I did not mean to imply that they were the only people who were affected. Right now, it's very dark, literally and figuratively in Laplace, but all of Louisiana, uh, all of South Louisiana was badly. So thank you, Samantha, for reminding me about that and correcting me on that. You were right to do that. But getting back to this amazing idea of a nationwide movement. Now, how do, how do we do this? Well, I will say there is one group, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, who is kind of at beginning to do this. Uh, the uh, I believe they go by the name uh, Anthropocene Alliance now, um, and they are kind of a, just a, a national umbrella group that is trying to kind of gather together all of the kind of small, very often like kitchen table grassroots groups across the country that are fighting for flood mitigation efforts or uh, working on recovery efforts in their communities. So um, I think that's one example of kind of where we're already starting to see this movement emerge. Uh, we need it on a much, much larger scale. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, again, as these disasters continue to happen and that we see more platforms emerge, like your podcast, for example, where uh, people are able to listen, get advice on how to get involved in doing disaster activism, where um, people hear the experiences of others, hopefully are reaching out to those folks to learn more, that kind of organically some of this will emerge. Well, one of the things I'm hoping, thank you for that, uh, the kind words about my podcast, what I'm hoping is people don't feel so alone. There's nothing worse than feeling alone uh, and that no one understands what's happening to you and no one understands what the problem is. And that aloneness is very scary and frightening and, and, and dispiriting, for lack of a better word. And that's one of the things I'd hope to accomplish uh, with the podcast. The, uh, I also want to thank you before I forget for helping me understand that you have disasters and then you have catastrophes. And after I read your book, I stopped referring to the levee breach disaster, which claimed the lives of over 1500 people. Um, there are other estimates, it's more like 2000 people um, and that an entire city obliter almost obliterated. So in, in your uh, terminology and your verbiage, the levee breach event of 2005 was a bona fide catastrophe. Right. And, and, right. and that's the word that should be used, catastrophe. And then you also have disasters. And I thank you for, for bringing that to my attention. Words matter. Words are really, really important. So thank you for that. So, the, um, so moving along, I did want to ask you, uh, you know, and thank you for explaining why don't we have emergency ref management reform uh, yet. It, it is amazing to me that we're not there yet. But then we, as you pointed out, we have we have the, these lobbyists and we have the oil companies and we have large powerful group that don't want uh, emergency management reform. So, um, and then in, a, in, addition to th in addition to that, Congress also can do some really stupid things. In New Orleans, after the levees broke, the, the Congress turned to the people responsible that the Army Corps of Engineers and gave them a big pile of money and said, here you go, build it again, and this time do it right. And oh, this time do it really, really, really fast. We need it in a hurry. The, uh, the exact same organization that was at fault. So clearly something's wrong uh, with the way our members of Congress are doing things, but they are doing something right. Um, Samantha, are you familiar with um, a bill uh, being a, a bipartisan bill? Uh, it's actually my Senator, Bill Cassidy of Louisiana and Brian Schatz of Hawaii 
have announced the, the introduction of a piece of legislation called the Disaster Learning and Life-Saving Act of 2020. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I have. I've heard about it. Well, I'm glad you, glad you heard about it. It's been a year and I haven't heard a whole lot about it. But when I heard this, I thought, well, this is, this is great. It's a bipartisan legislation, good, which would create a new permanent independent board to study the underlying causes of disaster related fatalities and property damage nationwide. And it would make recommendations to all levels of government on how to improve uh, the community resiliency across the whole country. Well, this sounds like a great idea to me. And, and yet here it's been a year, I haven't heard any, any movement about it whatsoever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where they're at with this. I will say the idea kind of on its surface is a really good one. Of course, always, you know, hesitate to wait to see how it's actually implemented. But, you know, this idea that we have these disasters happening repeatedly and these disasters aren't natural, right? There is a human, there are human factors that are leading to these disasters, whether that is the role of climate change, but more directly how and where we are building, where people are living, the laws and policies that lead to people living where they do uh, in, you know, creating our risk across the country and to have a, a government body that specifically comes in post-disaster to look at all of those different factors to identify which have led to the disaster that has occurred and hopefully make recommendations for changes is really good. The one thing I really do hope with this uh, group, if it manifests, is that it will uh, incorporate our existing empirical disaster research into the work that they're doing. We have, uh, you know, this, we've been studying disasters for over a hundred years. We, we have this massive body of literature that can really be useful here. And one of our biggest challenges is actually getting that research implemented into practice, into policy. And I am, you know, again, with like some hesitation, but I'm, I'm hopeful that this could be an avenue for helping us get that research into practice and policy eventually. I hope so too. When I read about this legislation, I actually called the Senator's office um, the following Monday. I, I heard about it on a Friday. I called them on Monday and said, I'm here. I stand by you ready to help with this. And I also uh, very much agree with something you just said, that disasters are man-made. They're not um, made by nature, um, natural made. Uh, the, the title of my book, Words Whispered in Water, uh, what it means is behind talk of water and wind, human beings are hiding. Uh, right. So anything that blames the wind and the water, human beings are hiding behind those words. And that's that inspired the title of my book. Uh, I wanted to also to, to compare, I wanted to uh, share uh, something that happened to me while I literally the day I evacuated um, to get away from uh, Hurricane Katrina, because it, it, my, my husband is born and raised in New Orleans, and he took one look at this storm and said, we're getting out. And we did, we evacuated. And I ran into, um, on the elevator of the hotel where we evacuated. And um, this was after it, the, the severity of, of the breach event was be becoming apparent. So this was probably three or four days after, excuse me, three or four days after. Uh, and we knew the levees had broken. We, we were getting a, a feeling of how bad the disaster was. And this kind woman that thought she was being so helpful and believed she was being helpful said to us, I understand how you feel. She said, I, I wasn't home, but my house burned to the ground, was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. No one was hurt. No one was home, but I know how you feel. And we said, thank you very much. But she doesn't know how we feel because even though her house was burnt to the ground, which is horrible, she still had her church, uh, her grocery store, her post office, her doctor's office, her restaurant. Uh, she probably had family nearby. Most people have family that they can go visit. We didn't say any of this, of course. Uh, we, we said, thank you very much. Yes, you know exactly how we feel. And we went on our way. But the sort of disaster that you're talking about in your book, Disasterology, is one that hits a lot of people. Uh, that is a true disaster, uh, on, and some of them may even be on the levels of catastrophe. What would you have said to this, um, to this nice lady had she said this to you? 
Well, I probably would have done what you did, but um, to kind of explain this, right, what she's describing is this like personal emergency, right? To her, that was a catastrophic experience. She lost her home. She lost everything that she had. And that absolutely is traumatic and awful. At the same time, like you described, there is a very big difference between individual loss, uh, you know, one person experiencing something, even, you know, an apartment building down where you have multiple people impacted, right? This, what we would call an emergency. Again, truly terrible, but it is on such a different scale than a disaster and especially a, a catastrophe as you all experienced. And it is difficult to kind of compare those apples to oranges, right? Um, there, there are major differences, like you described, that, that loss of your social network of uh, displacement of culture, the you know complete economic turmoil, right? The, just the never kind of ending list of uh, essentially needing to re build an entire city is uh, you know, a completely different uh, situation to try and address than one individual needing to rebuild their home. But I, I will say she was very nice. She was awfully <laughs> nice because it's, it's awful being a, 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 yeah. a evacuee. Uh, right. And uh, she, I, I remember her to this day. She was very, very warm and very nice. And wherever you are, if you're listening, thank you so much. Uh, and hope your house got rebuilt we, we to you. Hope you made some renovations that you've always wanted to do anyway uh, in, in the rebuild. Well, is there um, anything that you would like to add? Uh, any um, word of encouragement that you'd like to give our listeners? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, I know as we are watching these disasters unfold one after another across the country, that it is extremely overwhelming, especially doing this in the middle of a pandemic for over a year and a half. And it, you know, it fully acknowledge how overwhelming it is. We also can change the way we do emergency management. We can be doing so, so much more to be preventing these events from occurring. We can be doing more to prepare for them when they do happen. We can change the way we respond to them and we can make recovery more effective and more just for the people who have to go through that process. But it is going to require that everybody in all of these communities across the country that are being affected uh, come together, work together, reach out, connect with one another, uh, and start building uh, that that capacity start building that collective strength to be able to uh, to make these changes that we need not only locally but nationally. So we have plenty of reason to hope, and we, we need, do. We need to take the burden off of the of the survivors uh, and help them, and 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 work together, and change will come. And, and it's slow, but change does come, especially when you when you're focused, and you are definitely focused. I am on a one woman mission to get us comprehensive emergency management reform. So fingers crossed. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Samantha Montano, author of Disasterology, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Climate Crisis. Thank you for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Okay, stay, stay with me for one more second. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.